Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Lessons of the Wild podcast, The Beginner's Guide to Hunting. I'm your host, Alex Hernandez. Thank you for listening. So this episode, I'm going to cover a topic that when I first started hunting, I felt was super intimidating, and that is field dressing the animal you just successfully killed. Um, That's gutting an animal, if you didn't know. Um, And I was really worried about it when I first started hunting, so I'm going to take the time to kind of go over a bunch of things that I wish I knew before I started to do my research, because I felt like there's a lot of things hunters just assume you understand, and there's a lot of things a lot of hunters don't actually understand, and they just do it. So I'm going to take the time to cover some basic anatomy differences in animals and kind of go over stuff uh, so you can start your research and get a good foot in the door. All right. I hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, so before we get started here, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, The first one being that there is no way I can do the technique of field dressing justice by talking about it. Um, There's just no way to convey the proper way to go about things in the field when you need it most through spoken word. So instead of me talking technique, I'm going to give you a bunch of things that I wish I knew before I ever had to field dress an animal. Um, That being said, I'm going to give you right now a list of videos on YouTube that I want you to watch before even listening to this podcast um, and then after listening to this podcast. I think the before perspective and the after perspective are going to be different after this podcast and I think or this episode, rather, um, I think it'd be very valuable to watch it beforehand and then see it in a different light after we talk about it some, okay? So, the first video I want you to check out, and it's for any hoofed or horned or antlered creature, is um, How to Field Dress a Deer with Steve Rinella. Um It's by Steve Rinella and the Meat Eater Crew, who if you don't know about, you should know about, and watch the show on Netflix and listen to the podcast. It's great. Um, But it shows a technique that is pertinent to any big game animal. You can do it with any hooved, horned, or antlered animal. Um, It's a great, great video. goes in the technique. It's really slow. Um, Give you a really good idea about what needs to be done and how to go about it. Okay. Um, Another one. I want you to watch for animals with similar structure, uh, but are small and small game, is how to skin and clean a rabbit with Steve Rinella. So, same guy. Uh, He does really good, great videos. Um, And this rabbit technique can be applied to any small game that's a mammal, like a squirrel or any other, I don't know, rodent of some kind. I don't know what else is out there right now. I'm pretty tired. It's getting late. Um... I want you to watch those two for mammals and then birds. Um, I have a really good video is how to field dress pheasant and quail without wasting any meat quick and easy by Sean James. That's S-H-A-W-N James. Uh, Super great video. He runs through uh, skinning and gutting a pheasant and quail. Super just high quality video. Highly recommend it. and then, but note that you don't have to um, skin a bird. You can pluck it. And I think a great example of that is another Steve Vanilla video who apparently I really like. <laughs> so it's how to pluck and clean a turkey with Steve Vanilla. Um, and he skins a turkey and just a general way to field dress and even prepare a turkey. So highly recommend those videos. If you want to do yourself a huge favor, watch them before we, you listen to this podcast. Stop the, just pause it, go watch them, um, and then I think it'll be valuable for you. And then after, watch them again so you can really see what I'm talking about and what I take note of, okay? Um, All right, Uh, before we really get into it again, I want to tell you I'm going to be making some assumptions, okay? And I'm going to give you a disclaimer what those assumptions are. The first thing I'm going to assume is that this is your first time ever dealing with this topic and you don't know what's going on. So I'm going to kind of speak about it in a very fundamental and basic manner. Um, 
So if you've done this before and are just kind of listening to the podcast because you're a fan, I appreciate it, but this might not be the episode for you. Uh, so if you don't want to listen to it, you won't hurt my feelings. But I still think there's going to be a bunch of good information, so you might learn something. Maybe just hit the two times the speed to crank through it so it's not too slow for you to get to the stuff that you don't know quickly. Um, another assumption I'm going to make is that in the, in the act of field dressing, you need to have this animal killed, and I'm assuming that you as the hunter have killed the animal clean and effectively in the vitals that are meant to be um, shot <laughs> and taken care of, whether it be with a gun or a bone arrow. Um, because if you don't hit the vitals that I'm assuming you're hitting and you hit, let's say, the guts, it can really change what you have to do for field dressing. So I'll kind of touch on that a little in here if I can, uh, which I can. I definitely will be. <laughs> um, so just, I'll just pay attention to that. For the most part, I'm assuming you're hitting... The head, heart, or lungs, depending on which animal you're, you're hunting. Birds usually go for the head. Um, and my last assumption is that the techniques I showed you in those videos are not meant for uh, taxidermy. Okay, um, I'm here strictly to provide ideas about meat harvest. Um, antlers are great and trophies are great. I'm all about them, don't get me wrong. But uh, these techniques aren't meant for taxidermy. So if you happen to think that you might per chance, get a trophy animal, you definitely need to look up different techniques to field dressing because it changes things. Um, I think the most effective way is to really just call the taxidermist you'd want to use. It might be bad luck or jinxing it or whatever, but it's better to know it and know how he or she wants it done so you don't mess it up and make their life harder and spend a bunch of money and still have something funky looking. So I think that's something to take good note of. This is really just for the most basic basic and fundamental concepts of field dressing, okay? Not preserving an animal for memories. And you're just preserving the hide if you didn't know that. It's not you're not wasting any meat. Just note that, okay? All right. Now that we have our little disclaimer discussion done, what is field dressing and why do we do it? So, field dressing, also known as gutting, is the act of separating the internal organs from the carcass of the animal, animal harvested immediately after the kill in the field. All right, pretty simple, getting the organs out, putting them aside, okay? So why do we do that? Uh, the main reason is to reduce the temperature of the remaining carcass. Um, so why do we want to do that? Because in the act of killing, you're introducing bacteria in an otherwise sterile environment. Uh, if you didn't know that, meat and every other aspect of the body besides the GI tract and maybe the conjunctive of the eyes are bacteria-free. Um, if you get bacteria in those areas, let's just use us as an example, you get an infection or an abscess. Same thing with mammals and same thing with birds. That's why we give antibiotics when we, they need them in animals and farm animals and uh, they don't feed them antibiotics, if you didn't know that. That used to be a thing. It's not anymore. Long gone. But uh, now they just give them when they're sick. Same with us. Okay. Um, so, in the act of killing it, we're introducing this bacteria into a sterile environment. And that bacteria can cause spoilage when it grows. And because a body is the ideal temperature for cells to live and grow, bacteria can flourish, okay? So by reducing the temperature, we're slowing bacterial growth and thus slowing spoilage. Okay, um, also, field dressing itself will introduce bacteria because everything external on the hide has bacteria covering. It's like our skin. The hide is their skin and it's meant to protect the internal body from contamination and infection. Um, so by cutting into that, we are introducing bacteria. And in the meat industry, uh, most contamination comes from poor field or slaughter, poor slaughter uh, technique, and that includes dressing the animal and skinning it because a lot of animals like to roll around in their own poop and you get E. coli that way. So uh, be careful, all right? Um, clean everything and cook everything. Um, note that meat is sterile on the inside, 
once you get it out. So when you cut into something is when you're introducing bacteria. Uh, I'll get into this later in a different podcast, but I just want you to know it now so it's in the back of your head. But uh, grinding meat, um, you're introducing bacteria throughout it. It's more important that you cook that all the way through than it is a steak, I'd say. But there are other things like parasites and stuff that can get you sick still. So follow your cooking temperature reg uh, recommendations, okay? Um, okay, so active killing and field dressing can introduce this bacteria. Now, so why is it important that we separate the internal organs? Well, like I said earlier, the GI tract of an animal, that is mouth to butt, the butthole, uh, on any animal is the only part of the body that is exposed to the external environment. So the food of whatever the animal or we, for example, eat is full of bacteria and our gut is thus full of it as well. Um, if you've ever heard that babies are born without any gut bacteria so their poop doesn't stink, it's true. Okay, so the act of consuming external things introduces bacteria into the gut system from which it flourishes and forms a symbiotic or beneficial relationship with the host, helping digest foods and making more nutrients available to um, to the, the host. Okay, so it's right here, gut flora. We all have it, but if it is in the wrong place or stays in a non-modal um, GI tract too long, it will spoil the organ that it's in by consuming it and then move on to whatever's around it so i.e. the meat so we get rid of the GI tract uh, and all the other organs and get it out of that carcass as soon as we can so we're really just trying to prevent spoilage with field dressing and getting that temperature down now there are a lot of other organs in there um, our second priority is usually the bladder and the urethra to get urine out of there, but urine is also sterile, so it's not really nearly as big a deal if you accidentally puncture it. But uh, it does, it, well, no, I shouldn't say sterile because it can carry viruses, but um, yeah, it's not nearly as scary, okay, as far as meat spoilage goes. Um, but there are a bunch of other organs, and people, depending on the culture that you're in, or if you're just in whatever mood, like to eat a bunch of different organs, uh, including heart, uh, liver, uh, thyroid, which is sweet bread, if you've heard of those, um, small intestine, which um, you have to clean real, real well because that's full of poopy, um, stomach, um, which is tripe, if you didn't know that, it's cow stomach or any ruminant animal stomach, really. Um, but just that's just notes to know. Again, we'll get into a meat processing podcast episode at a later date, but just things to know. But for, so you can focus, field dressing is still separating those organs from there. But our priorities are the GI tract and the bladder and urethra. Uh, getting those out of there to prevent bacterial spoil spoilage. Now, the anatomy of the GI tract and the organs kind of depend on the animal. Okay, um, it varies really from species to species in minute ways. As far as let's say mammals, they're pretty much the same, but in minute ways they're all different. Um, and birds are very different from mammals, but within themselves have little differences as well. Um, but the basic concept of field dressing isn't affected. By them, for the most part, by these things. The technique will be as far as birds and mammals, but mammals and birds have their own unique technique that usually is unaffected by differences in anatomy, okay? Um, so let's talk about anatomy. Like I said, anatomy differs between mammals and birds pretty severely, um, but the basic concepts are in general still the same. So both have an outer layer of skin covered in either fur or plumage, also known as feathers, um, and the skin surrounds uh, fat, muscle, nerves, blood vessels, um, the body cavity, 
the organs in the body, um, the brain, eyes, lungs, I said bones, liver, pancreas, uh, and the differences really lie in the GI tract, like we talked about, uh, the number of body cavities, and the reproductive organs. So let's start with the simple one, and that's body cavities. Now what is a body cavity? A body cavity is just where organs are contained, right? So in mammals, there's two. There's the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity. So, um, and they're separated by the diaphragm. So from our ribs, our ribs have our lungs and heart and esophagus, and at the base of our ribs, at the very bottom, is a muscle that helps us breathe called the diaphragm. And we're a mammal, and so are deer, and so are moose, and elk, and antelope, and et cetera, et cetera, squirrel, rabbit, anything that gives live birth, right? Um, and that muscle helps us breathe, but it also separates that area, the pluck, and animals in the industry it's called, uh, from the abdominal cavity, which houses stomach, liver, pancreas, large intestine, small intestine, um, bladder, kidneys, uh, fallopian tubes of the female, okay? Um, whereas in birds, there's just one. It's just one big thing, okay? There's no separation from church and state. <laughs> it's all one big cavity, okay? Um, which makes field dressing different because the body cavity kind of affects the way you go about things, um, which you'll, you have seen in the videos if you stopped um, and watched. Um, birds, they kind of just stick their hand up in there and pull it all out. Where mammals, they kind of have to open up the abdominal cavity and kind of reach up into the rib cage to get the others out, etc., etc. Okay, now let's talk reproductive organs. Um, mammals obviously have penises and vaginas. If you didn't know that, I hate to give you the birds and the bees talk, kids. Ask mommy and daddy, go to health class, do what you gotta do. Um, but birds, they tend to only have what's called the cloaca. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute because the cloaca is kind of the end-all, be-all of a bird's system. Um, it houses fecal excretion, it houses urine excretion, and also has, uh, it produces sperm and over uh, the eggs. I'm going to say ovarian, but I don't think that's right. Um, I'm tired. It's like midnight, maybe 1 o'clock. I've been struggling getting this podcast going and organized properly, but I think I finally got it for you guys. Um, so that's something to note. And when you're field dressing um, mammals, you have to be careful severing around a penis and a vagina. They're different. It's little, it's subtle differences in field dressing, but it's something to pay attention to. And I'm sure you've seen that if you watch the videos in the Steve Ranella uh, field dressing a deer, he cuts around the penis and leaves the testicles intact on the carcass, which something you should also note that state laws require proof of sex on some animals, so pay attention to your state laws, of course, as always. Um, and another example, if you watch the same video, he also cuts around the anus. Now, on a deer, Right under the anus, if it was a female, it would be the vagina, and you would do the same thing. So that's something to note there. Um, but on birds, the cloaca is just a little hole under the tail, and it does everything. Okay, now there are exceptions. I think ducks might have a penis, but there's, for the most part, there's a, one hole, and that's kind of where you're going to go from as far as gutting it goes. Okay, um, and you'll see that in the Sean James video and the other Steve Ranella turkey video. Okay, um, so that's something to know. Now, the really big difference comes, well, not really, it's not really a huge difference, but it, it, for the, the concepts of the GI tract are the same in birds and mammals, but are different. And I think the best way to talk about the entire anatomy of both creatures that kind of follow the path from mouth to cloaca or anus. Um, so let's do that, okay? I'm going to start with mammals because I'm going to use us as an example, but it applies to, to everything, okay? So from us, we start with our mouth. In our mouth, we have our teeth, tongue, everything, okay? And 
you go down our throat, which is your esophagus, and our esophagus goes down our neck into our chest cavity, okay? Um, that's where our ribs are, right? So you enter the rib cage. We have collarbones. Um, most four-legged creatures do not. That's something to note. That's different. Um, so it goes through the chest cavity. goes all the way down. In us, it's from head to toe. Uh, in four-legged creatures, head to butt. It's following that path. Um, and it goes all the way through the diaphragm. Okay, there's a little hole in the diaphragm that the esophagus will pass through. Um, it doesn't affect the diaphragm, that's just how it's formed, okay? Um, and in the chest cavity, there's the heart and the lungs, and the lungs are stuck to the sides of the rib cage, which if, you're, if you've killed this animal, ideally you've hit in the rib cage, and depending on the round, they're usually not existent because all the energy explodes them, essentially, and that's how an animal dies. And the heart may or may not be there as well, depending on the round you've shot and if you hit it in the heart. But if the heart's intact, very delicious piece of meat. Highly recommend it. Um, so save it. Okay, so it goes through the chest cavity, past the heart and the lungs, through the diaphragm, and this is where it meets the stomach. Now, you might might have heard this. If not, I'm introducing to it or introducing you to it. But the saying that cows have four stomachs. Now. This is kind of a misnomer. Cows don't actually have four separate stomachs. They have a one stomach that has four separate chambers within it. Um, now, why why would they possibly need that? Well, cows and deer and elk and moose and caribou and antelope and uh, not horses. Well, let me rephrase this. And horses can all digest grass. Um, not all of them are ruminant, though. Where us humans and bears and raccoons and I don't know if there are squirrels and rabbit, maybe rabbit can, I don't know, rabbit's anatomy, but we can't, for the most part, digest grasses because there's too much cellulose and we can't break it down. But ruminant animals, horses are not ruminant, something to note, and I don't know if goats and sheep are or not, I'm pretty sure they are, but um, ruminant animals will have these chambered stomach which allow them to intake these grasses, um, go through a set of chambers, and between each chamber they regurgitate and then will chew this food further. And typically you'll hear a beer, uh, excuse me, a deer will go and bed down to chew his cud. Now cud is just that regurgitated grass and what other, other cellulose-ridden plant that he's chewing on, or she's chewing on. Okay, and cows usually just lay down and you see them chomping away at it. And it takes a long time, but they're able to draw energy from things that we as other mammals cannot do. So um, any mammal that chews, chews on cud is considered a ruminant animal or an ungulate. I could be wrong here, I could be misspeaking, but there are definitely ungulates, okay? Uh, but rumination is the process of breaking down cellulose to get energy from Okay, and it's uh, it's just still one stomach though, and that's what I want you to know. So you just got a little, little confusing aspect here. So let's kind of go back. So this chambered stomach is all within one stomach. So again, esophagus. We go mouth to throat, which is our esophagus, through the chest cavity, through the diaphragm, to a stomach of some kind. Okay, all that chamberedness doesn't matter as far as field dressing goes. That's just a little tidbit that you should know for your basic animal knowledge. Okay, now from the stomach, the stomach processes food and then it goes into the small intestine. Okay, which if you've ever seen the picture of human organs, it's the long tangly one that they say if you stretch across whatever it will go a mile or whatever, it's nonsense, but um, it's small. It's thin and it's just a bunch of tangles and it looks like a mess. Um, the beginning of that is called the duodenum and I'm, that's just basic anatomy stuff you should know. And then there's the pancreas surrounding that and connected to it. Um, it's not important. But the liver and gallbladder are also connected to it, and the gallbladder puts bile into the small intestine, which helps emulsify fats and digest things further. Um, 
only thing to note there is that if you want to keep the liver, you have to separate the gallbladder from the liver, or else it'll spoil it and it's going to be gross. You generally don't freeze liver. Again, meat processing, I will get to later. Keep it in the back of your mind. But the, same, the tube is still from stomach to small intestine, and those are just accessory things. Now, from the small intestine, you enter the large intestine, which kind of, if you look at the human anatomy, wraps around the small intestine. Um, and that includes your colon, okay? Your large intestine, the end of it is called your colon, which leads to the rectum. Now, at some point, the ureters will connect the large intestine to the kidneys. Um, so the large intestine's job is to take water from the, whatever we eat or drink and give it to the kidneys to filter, and the kidneys will intake or get rid of excess water or ions or whatever it needs to do, and then send it to the bladder, which is separate from the GI tract but attached to the kidneys. So there is that weird, like, two degrees of separation, right? Um, so if you remove the GI tract, you're not going to spill urine, but if you puncture the bladder, you will. But uh, that's just something to know. Okay, and from the bladder, you have the urethra to either the vagina or the penis. Okay? I'll let you know that. So the active field dressing is taking that tube out. Um, some, some people cut up the throat and remove the esophagus all the way through. Some people just cut the esophagus um, at the top of the rib cage, not the diaphragm. Um, whatever. Uh, some things to note. Um, all the organs in a mammal are attached to the back side of the cavity, so the spine side, by connective tissue, and it makes your life a hell of a lot easier to sever that with your knife in bigger animals, okay? And you just easy pulls away. Um, something to also note is just cut the diaphragm out um, before you start tugging on those organs in the chest cavity because that diaphragm will um, keep you from getting those organs out easily. Something also to note in bigger animals like elk and moose, you can keep that diaphragm. That is the skirt steak. Again, sorry, jumping ahead of myself, but... If you're at this point, good to know. Okay, so that is the basic anatomy of a mammal. Now that applies to deer, squirrel, rabbit, um, and the concept of removing it is all the same. And if you've seen the videos, rabbit applies to squirrel as well. I'm sure there's other rodents, but it's all the same, right? There's, I'm sure there's differences and there are nuances too, but it doesn't matter because you just need to get them out and the GI tract is where all the bad stuff is, so avoid puncturing it. Now let's say you take a shot on a deer and you hit the guts. Um, that's not good. One, because it spills all that stuff into the abdominal cavity um, and the chest cavity more than likely. And in that system there are a bunch of enzymes that help digest the things that we're made of, right? We're it's all full of acid and enzymes that break down proteins and can spoil meat even quicker. So if that happens, one, that animal is going to be stressed out and that affects meat taste again, getting ahead of myself, but um, you have a higher chance of spoilage. So if it's a hotter temperature, you need to be quick. Um, you need to know that animal's dead. You don't want to push it. You, you just run the risk of spoiling meat. Okay. And it happens. It happens a lot, and it happens to a lot of people. Um, it hasn't happened to me yet, thankfully, but it's bound to. Okay, so don't feel like it's the worst thing to ever happen. It sucks. It does not feel good. I, you get very upset. I've almost had that happen. I thought I did, and it felt terrible. But, um, yeah, it can, it can go bad. So just know you have to rinse that out with water thoroughly, and you might have meat loss. So just expect it. Okay. Let's move to birds, uh, GI tract. So um, let's start at the beak. Note that birds do not have teeth. That is important. So birds kind of just swallow things whole. Um, from the beak, you go down the throat, and then you may or may not enter a organ called a crop. Now, a crop is just um, an organ that stores food to moisten it and kind of soften things. So if you 
get a bird that has a crop. I'm not really sure, but I know chickens have a crop. Um, let's say they have corn, and it'll be nice and mushy and gross looking if you open that up. Um, but it's a good way to see what the birds have been eating because it's still intact. It hasn't really been digested. It's just moistened. So a lot of people like to open the crop and see what's in there and see what they're eating, kind of get an idea of what's going on with that animal and its habits. Um, good to know. But not all birds have crop, so... You know, just kind of got to know your individual species. I'll leave that homework up to you guys. Um, from the crop, you go to the proventriculus, which I think is how that's pronounced. Let me check it out here real quick on the loud computer. Da, 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 da. Sorry, delay. Yeah, proventriculus, which at, is, in comparison to mammals, is the stomach. Right? There's acids there, there's enzymes there that help break down whatever the the bird is consuming um, but it doesn't break it down fully and you know this in a minute because after the proventriculus you enter the gizzard now a lot of people eat this organ so it's good to know but um, what a gizzard is is an organ it's like basically a muscular organ that birds use to help grind up the half digested food right so birds will swallow pebbles which can go through their stomach without being affected, really. And it'll keep in the gizzard, and that gizzard stores those rocks, and digested food will move through there, and that gizzard will contract and start um, start grinding things up for it, for the animal so it can more readily, readily absorb its nutrients. Um, which is a good thing, and people like to open that up, clean it out, and fry them up, and they can be really good. Uh, make giblets with it. Um, same with the neck meat. I wouldn't use the esophagus <laughs> of the bird, but um, neck meat's good as well to make giblets and gravy and all those things. Um, and people open up and find some interesting stuff in there, too, because birds just will pick up anything. It's really hard. So, fun fact. Okay, so from the gizzard... Uh, you enter the small intestine, which has the pancreas and the liver attached to it as well. It's kind of similar to a mammal. And from uh, the small intestine, you enter the, the colon. Uh, and that has a cica attached to it, but that's not important. It's basically the large intestine. And that colon leads to the cloaca and the vent. So the cloaca is that end-all, be-all organ for birds I was telling you about. Um, that is where feces come out, and that is where urine comes out, and that is where sex organs are stored, I guess, sex cells, germ cells. Um, and that is used for everything. So there's no bladder. There's no urethra. There's nothing to worry about spilling urine. Um, but you've got you to gotta get it all out. Um, and they only have one body cavity, so it's all kind of hanging out in there. Um, and I'm sure you noted, I talked about it already, that they just kind of reach up there after they open it up and pull it all out. And their landmark for finding where to cut is the cloaca. You cut right around that, and you're not going to do any harm by pulling it out. Um, one thing to note is that in the act of pulling it out, you're going to rip things, and you're going to open up the GI tract and get stuff there. So it's really important you rinse out your birds really, really well. Okay. Um, in, in the industry... The USDA requires birds to be soaked in a chlorine solution, especially chicken, um, because the act of eviscerating the animal or gutting the animal, um, just you spread poop everywhere, and there's no way to avoid it because you're yanking things out. Okay, um, You're going to get poop on your hands. It's normal. It's whatever. Just wash everything. Wash your hands. Um, you'll see in the videos uh, that Sean James, he cuts everything and does it all. You can either gut first and wash your hands or gut last. Um, I think gutting first is probably the best move. Personally, if you're out in the field, just get it done. If you are going to be out there all day, you know, and things get hot, just get those, get that body temperature down. Keep the meat as long as you can. But, you know, rinse things, cook things thoroughly. That's why chickens get salmonella as people undercook stuff and they were covered in poop at one point in time. So, uh, internally. But that's, that's basically the differences in anatomy. Now, I'm sure there's really nuanced differences between subspecies of 
those categories, but the concepts of field dressing, it doesn't matter, okay? Just know the big things I've talked about. Um, and I really want you to go back and watch those videos. Um, I got one more thing. Oh, when gutting a bird, um, I want you to know that the lungs really like to stick to the ribs, so really scrape the rib cage with your fingers to get all that extra lung meat out, okay? Uh, you don't need to, you can eat the livers, you can eat the gizzard, and, you know, make sure you get everything out, though. Okay, follow those videos. Uh, crop, important, don't eat that. Uh, one more thing before I get going here. Um, I want to talk about the gutless method. Now, this is kind of a subsidiary video. I didn't think I said that right. Anyways, I'm tired. Um... The gutless method is a method of field dressing for backcountry hunters, okay, and large animals. Um, it's an act of not having to mess with these large animals' organs because they're super heavy, okay. You, I mean, you will mess with them eventually, but it's not towards the end, and you're not pulling it out of the body cavity. You're essentially separating all the meat from the body cavities without opening them up until the very end, so you're not yanking 50-pound organs out full of gunk that you're going to be tugging on and piercing and tearing more than likely. So um, I have a video here that I didn't want you to watch beforehand because I think it's really complicated, but if you're going to be elk hunting in the backcountry or moose hunting or whatever backcountry hunting where you have to pack out meat on your back for long distances, this is the way to do it. And I want you to look up Elk 101 COM's video uh, it's not .com, they just left the dot out in, in their name, but it's elk101.com's gutless method for field dressing, and that's by elk101com. That's, that's, field, that's gutless method, and it's just a manner of field dressing without messing with the guts until the end of the process where it's vice versa. Now, I want you to know in Steve Rinella's video on cutting a deer, you can do that with any animal, period. But the gutless method is a way of doing it in a much more efficient manner in the backcountry, okay? So I didn't want you to have that in your head until the very end. Um, so please go back and watch those videos I said. Um, it'll, I think you'll have a new perspective on things and kind of see the differences. Um, it's hard for me to kind of see what I think you would need to know just because I've, I've just had this knowledge for a while. So I, um, if there's anything you don't understand or anything you want clarification on or anything I can help you with, please shoot me an email at lessonsforwild at gmail.com or hit me up on Instagram, lessons underscore of underscore the underscore wild. DM me, I'll get back to you. Facebook, I've had a couple fans message me on Facebook. I love it. I'm here to help you guys. I want communication. I'll answer you as soon as I can. You can ask my wife. I'm on my phone all the time. Uh, messing with social media, which I shouldn't be, but uh, this is what I want to do. I want to help you guys, so I'll get back to you quickly, and if I think a question is good enough to be on the podcast, I'll shoot on the podcast as well, but without, not without answering you as quickly as I can, okay? Um, hell, if you really don't understand what I'm saying, I'll give you a call on FaceTime, and uh, that probably won't hold if I get a bunch of followers but right now I can do that um, so please hit me up if you have any questions at all um, if you guys would do me a favor I'm really trying to grow this following I've had a lot of good feedback if you want to send me feedback even if it's I think you're an idiot and you don't you shouldn't be doing this I'd love to hear it um, share it with your friends share it with your family share it with anybody you think would be remotely interested in hunting my goal is to make hunting more accessible to everyone so if you want to be a good fan, a good friend to me, I'd really appreciate it, okay? All right, everyone, have a good evening. Thank you for listening.